Good day, TBC family. Welcome once again to our online worship service. Now, today we will be talking about unity. Now, personally, I am a big fan of the National Basketball Association or the NBA. And while I was thinking about unity, there was this specific NBA team that came into my mind. And I am talking about the 2012-2013 Los Angeles Lakers. Now, when this team was formed before the start of the 2012 NBA regular season, there was so much hype and excitement and there was high expectations for this team. They were expected to win the championship for that season. They were expected to win actually more than one championship. They were even expected to be an NBA dynasty, meaning they were, they were supposed to dominate the NBA League for how many years? Now, with a starting lineup, uh, starting five of Kobe Bryant, Dwight Howard, Steve Nash, Pau Gasol, and Ron Artest, they had five All-Stars, they had five championship level players, they had five experienced players, and three of them were former MVPs. So, no wonder why everyone was so excited to see this team play. But, when the preseason started, they were eight, zero, eight with zero wins and eight losses. They were expected to be number one in the standings. But instead, when the regular season started, most of the time, they had more losses than wins. And they even struggled to get into the playoffs. So instead of winning a championship, they were eliminated in the first round of the NBA playoffs. The season was so disappointing that after the season, they traded the other players and disbanded the five all-star team. This 2012-2013 Lakers team will go down in history as one of the most disappointing teams ever. This team had so many problems, but one major problem they had was the lack of unity. The lack of unity. This team had so much potential, but because they were not united, they struggled to achieve the main goal. This team had great players, but because they didn't like each other, they couldn't function to the highest potential. This team had high hopes, but their efforts were wasted. Now, a church is our spiritual family, but we also work together as a team. God gave a purpose to His church, meaning all churches, and that is to glorify God, reach the lost, and disciple believers. And here at TBC, we also work together towards our goal, purpose, and vision. Our goal is to make every believer a spiritual leader. Our purpose, loving God and loving people, and our vision is connecting people to Jesus and training believers. But our church and churches all around the world struggle with unity. We are experiencing conflict between members, disunity, and distrust. And here at TBC, we are for sure not exempted from these problems. We also experience misunderstandings, conflicts, and separation inside our church. In reality, the church can sometimes be a source of hurt, pain, and disappointment. And if people look at our church and see how we treat each other, can we expect that they would believe us when we say we are God's people? If we treat each other harshly, can we expect people to agree with us when we say we are God's children? If we hate a brother or a sister in Christ, will people still be attracted to joining God's family? In the in the in our passage for today, Apostle Paul is encouraging the believers in Ephesus and us as well to walk in unity, to keep the unity of the church, and to treat each other with the right character. Now, a background on this passage is the majority of the people in the city of Ephesus worship the Greek goddess Artemis. But Apostle Paul preached Jesus Christ to these same people. He was teaching something different from what they were used to. He was teaching a different God from what they already knew. 
Now, if you lived back then and followed the teachings about Jesus Christ, it would have been dangerous for your life. But why did so many still choose to follow what Paul was teaching? It's because they saw the evidence. They saw that in the community of believers of Jesus Christ, whether rich or poor, Jew or Gentile, no matter your background or who you were, they treated each other equally. They treated each other with respect and they treated each other like family. And so the unity of the believers was evidence of the authenticity of their faith. The unity of the believers was evidence of the authenticity of their faith. The people of Ephesus heard the teachings of Jesus Christ and they saw the evidence of those teachings through the community of Christ. So we need to realize this. We need to realize that our unity and compassion for one another is our testimony to the lost. They back up our right to call ourselves God's family. And so the title that I have for us today for this message is, Let Us Strive for Unity in Our Church. We will be continuing our series, Save to Serve Lessons from the Book of Ephesians. And today we are at Ephesians 4, 1 to 6. So I encourage you to open your Bible to Ephesians 4, 1 to 6. Now, here Paul is transitioning us from the blessings we receive from God, that is in chapter 1, 2, and 3, to the way we need to respond to God in chapters 4, 5, and 6. So our passage teaches us how we should respond to God in the church setting. So let's read our main passage for today. It says there in Ephesians 4, 1 to 6, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all in all. Before we continue, let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for this opportunity to share your word. May you use this message to bring unity in our church, Lord God, and may you encourage us, Lord God, through your word, through your wisdom, and may you be with us, Holy Spirit, as we hear this message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, so again, we are still on our series, Saved to serve and we need to remember that we are saved to serve we give our lives to God not so that he will save us but he already saved us so now let us give our lives to him and with that in mind let's read again verse 1 of our main passage it says there as a prisoner for the Lord then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received so from this first verse, I have two observations that I want to share with you. First observation is, my first observation is, why would Paul start by saying, as a prisoner for the Lord? Just, be, just before Paul tells us to live a life for God, he reminds us that he is imprisoned for God. So why would he do that? Why would he do that? So. I can think of two, two reasons why he would do this. First is, he is showing us that this is, the, this is what following Jesus looks like. There will be many challenges. It won't be easy. You will do things you don't want to do and you will go places you don't want to go. Following Jesus means going against the ways of the world. People will not always agree with you. People will even persecute you. And following Jesus means denying yourself and denying a comfortable life. That is what Apostle Paul was pointing out. And second reason why he would say this is, Apostle Paul is telling us that, yes, I am in prison. Yes, I am poor. Yes, I am going through challenges all because I follow Jesus. But 
All these do not compare to the freedom I experienced in Jesus, the riches I will receive in heaven, and the grace and mercy God has showered upon him. And because of that, I am proud to be a prisoner for the Lord. That is what Apostle Paul is pointing out. Now, second observation that I have in this first verse is, um, Apostle Paul here is telling us to live our life for God. But before he gives the command or the encouragement to do so, he points out a reason or the reason why we should obey this command with the simple word then. The simple word then. In other translations of the Bible, the word is therefore. So what is the significance of this word then in our first verse? Then can mean therefore, or it can mean as a result of, or it could mean in that case, or that being so. So uh, let me explain it this way. Example, example if I say, if your mother raised you and your siblings with all her strength and capacity, she worked hard at her job just to pay for your tuition, and she sacrificed a lot for your future, then you should do your best as a student and not waste your mother's effort for you. In relation with our passage, Apostle Paul is saying something like this. If God chose you, adopted you, forgave you, redeemed you, rewarded you, saved you, changed you, gave you a new purpose and loves you, then you should live your life according to the calling he has for you. You see, the word then transitions us from all the blessings we received in chapters 1, 2, and 3 towards how we should respond, living our life for God, as taught in chapters 4, 5, and 6. So the first thing that I want us to know, our first point is, since God has blessed us with more than we deserve, let us do our best to follow His call for us. Now, what is our calling? What do we mean by this calling? We are called to be children of God. We are called to follow Jesus. If you are a student or a young professional, you are called to follow Jesus. If you are a parent or a senior citizen, you are called to follow Jesus. God's call is His invitation for us to live a life that is pleasing to Him, to live a life that is committed to His ways. Uh, let me explain it this way. Imagine that you are at a big event inside a big function hall with a lot of people. Now, your role in this event is you are an usher, and so you are wearing an ID that says usher. Now, as the event is ongoing, people see you just sitting at the back, using your sw your, you, uh, scrolling through your phone, and when people walk by you, you just look at them without smiling or greeting at them. You see people who are in need, but you just ignore them. Now, if that is the case, people will surely question if you really are an usher, right? Your, identi your identification says usher, but your actions don't show you're an usher. Just like in our life, our identity, our calling is to be children of God, followers of Jesus Christ. So our actions need to show it as well. And these verses that we are about to cover are telling us what we need to show inside the church. Ephesians 4, 2 says in our main passage, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. So our second point based on that verse is, let us improve our attitude towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us improve our attitude. Now, what kind of attitude adjustment do we need? We go back again to this verse 2. So, as we can see in verse 2, first, first atti attitude adjustment is, let us be humble towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. Humility is an accurate view of ourselves from God's perspective. Humility is viewing others greater than yourself. Humility is seen when we choose to serve others rather than wanting 
to be served. Humility is putting aside ourselves and choosing to prioritize others. Next thing we need to improve, let us be gentle towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. Gentleness is to be considerate, to have restraint. It can also be described as power under control. Gentleness is correcting someone's mistake by being honest to that person, at the same time building the person up. The opposite of that would be brutality where you are correcting a person or rebuking them by being honest but tearing the person down. Gentleness can be shown through the sandwich approach where you encourage the person, you give the rebuke or correction, and then you encourage the person once again. Honesty but building someone up. Brutality, the opposite, is just the rebuke or the correction. Honesty with no filter. It's honesty that puts people down. Next thing we need to uh, adjust in our attitude is let us be patient towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. Patience is trying not to avenge or pay back those who have wronged us. Patience is being slow to speak, slow to get angry, listening to the person first. It is also forgiving and giving more chances. Patience is when uh, someone offends us, but we decide to pray and bless the person instead of trying to ignore or pay back the uh, offense. Ignore the person or pay back the offense. Patience is realizing that the person who hurt you will probably hurt you again in the future, but still you choose forgiveness. Next is let us be willing to bear with one another in love. Bear with one another in love. Bearing with one another is putting up or tolerating with each other's personalities and characteristics. Bearing with one another is not giving up on one another. Having hope that the person who disappointed you will still grow. Bearing with one another means that even if this person annoys you or is frustrating you, uh, to you, towards you, you choose to love the person and and serve God with that person still. It is treasuring the relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ even when times get hard because there is love for one another. And the love that is used here in this verse is the agape love, the kind of love that does not ask anything in return. It just loves. Now, these uh, four are the attitudes God wants us to have inside the church or towards our fellow believers. Now, do you know the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat? A thermometer and a thermostat. A thermometer tells us the temperature of the room, while a thermostat controls the temperature of the room. There's a big difference. Now, here in this passage in Ephesians 4, God does not want us to be a thermometer. He doesn't want us to be all talk, always complaining like, uh, I don't like TBC because it is like this, it is like that. I don't like the people because they are like this or like that. But God wants us to be a thermostat and change the temperature of the room. So instead of talking and pointing out the wrong things, start being the change by being humble towards others, gentle towards others, being patient towards others, and willing to bear with one another in love. So, imagine naman if we uh, didn't act humble, gentle, patient, and we were not willing to bear with one another in the church, but instead we acted the opposite way of these four attitudes. Instead of humility, what if we were prideful? What if we are prideful instead of gentleness, brutality, instead of patience, always seeking revenge, instead of bearing with one, another, with one another in love, giving up on one another easily? If that was the case, what would become of our church? If we act like the opposite of who we were called to be, our church would probably close or disband. If we don't if we don't improve naman on these, on these attitudes, the situation of our, of our church won't improve 
either. But if we do our best in being humble, gentle, patient, and bearing with one another in love, then we will see improvements in our church, in our beloved TBC. And I believe we all want to see TBC, our church, grow in numbers and in quality. Amen ba? Amen. Now, I want us to look at our Bible, at those four attitudes one more time that we need to develop. Be humble, gentle, patient, and bear with one another in love. Now, what is our foundation in acting this way? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will always be our foundation. He is also our best example. We need to ask ourselves this. Was Jesus Christ humble towards us? Yes, he was God but chose to be treated like his creation and even insulted and beaten by his creation. Was Jesus Christ gentle towards us? Yes, he could have come down to earth and judge us harshly of our sin, but he chose to love and discipline us in a way that has grace. Was Jesus Christ patient towards us? Yes, he could have sent the wrath of God the moment we sinned against him, but he chose forgiveness instead. Did Jesus Christ bear with us in love? Yes, he could have turned his back on us. He could have given up on us, but he chose to treasure the relationship we have with him. God treated us with humility, gentleness, patience, and he was willing to bear with us. Now he is calling us to do the same to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us follow his example. Let us follow Jesus. That is what God desires. God knew what he was doing when he made TBC. He knew what he was doing when he assembled TBC. We can't say, uh, I don't like this person or this person hurt me, so I will avoid this person or ignore this person. But God put the two of you in each other's lives for a reason. God is not a nursery teacher that when two children fight, he will separate them and change the seating arrangement. But God said, love one another. Our church family is assembled like this for a reason. It is God's arrangement. Let us love the people he put in our lives. Let us live in unity. Live in unity. And the next verses in our main passage talk about that unity. It says in Ephesians 4.3, it says there, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The unity we have in the church is not an ordinary kind of unity. It is not like any other unity we may experience in a sports club, social group, or organization. I want us to remember this. God the Father desired and planned for this unity. And Jesus Christ suffered and died for this unity. If God gives so much importance to this unity that we have in the church, then we have the responsibility to preserve this unity. The verse says, make every effort to keep the unity. We don't create the unity. God created the unity. It is our job to maintain it, preserve it, and even improve it. So point three, let us maintain the unity of our church family. Let us maintain the unity. To make every effort to keep the unity includes to improve on those four attitudes I mentioned a while ago. Humility, gentleness, patience, and bearing with one another in love. To make every effort to keep the unity also means that when the time comes, you get discouraged. Don't run away from the church. When you feel guilty from your sin, don't fight your battles alone. Even when you get offended by other believers, don't turn your back on the church. To make every effort to keep the unity is to keep yourself from separating from your spiritual family. Now, why is unity 
so important. In 1 Peter 5.8, it says, Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The Bible describes the devil as a lion. Our spiritual enemy would love to, to cause division and separation. He would love to see us walk away from the church because just like a flock of sheep, the weakest ones will always be the ones who are alone. The easiest targets will always be the sheep who are away from the flock. So we need to choose unity for God and for us. So our previous verses taught us how we should act towards one another and that we should maintain the unity in the church. Now, in the last three verses of our passage, Apostle Paul tells us what unites us as brothers and sisters in Christ. In the last three verses of our main passage, it says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. So, so what unites us as a church? First is one body. We all belong to God's church family. All believers are united under Jesus, the head of the church. Different people making up one whole spiritual family. We have one spirit we all have the same Holy Spirit living in us and leading us. There is only one Holy Spirit. He lives in all of us. He is guiding all of us. And we all can ask Him uh, for help. One hope. We all look forward to the same hope in the future. All of us have received salvation. So we all look forward to receive what God has promised in heaven. We all look forward to our final destination in heaven. We, we will all see each other in heaven. Next is one Lord and one faith. We all were saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We all were saved by grace through faith. We all put our trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We all look to him as our number one authority in life. One baptism. We all share the same baptism. We were all baptized in the Holy Spirit. We were all given new lives. We all experienced life transformation. We all have the Holy Spirit helping us grow and mature. Now, water uh, baptism may differ from church to church, but our baptism by the Spirit is all the same for all believers. We were once spiritually dead, and now we are spiritually alive. And one God and Father. We all have the same Heavenly Father. We all were created by God. We're all His children. We all look to Him for provision, guidance, and grace. And we all can call Him our Father. So we have here a list of six reasons why we are united, why you and I are united, why the person in church is united with you. Six reasons why the person you are avoiding in church is united with you. Six reasons why the person who hurt you in this church is united with you. Now, you can make a list of things that divide us, like politics, education, family background, age, status, nationality, opinions, likes or dislikes, hobbies, perspectives, and many others. But that list will never compare to this list in Ephesians. We may be divided because of physical reasons, but we are united on a higher level. So as we serve in the ministry, as we come to church, for sure we will encounter hurt feelings and misunderstandings with one another. So next time you get into a misunderstanding or conflict, with a fellow believer, put this into your mind. Tell yourself this. Yes, we might have different opinions or perspectives, but we have the same spiritual family. We have the same Holy Spirit 
in us. We have the same hope. We have the same faith. We have the same Lord. We went through the same baptism. We have the same Father in heaven. No matter how different you may be with one another, different in size, different in background, different in perspective, remember this. The things that unite us as a church family are far greater than the things that divide us. That is our last point. Now, when talking about living a life worthy of our calling, why does Apostle Paul start with unity of believers? It is because living out our faith without other believers can be exhausting. It can be exhausting. That is why the life group is so important. After a long week of challenges, the life group is a place to unload your burdens. When we struggle to be a blessing in our family or workplace, the life group is a place for encouragement. When we stumble because of sin, the life group is a place for understanding, grace, and correction. Practice humility, gentleness, patience, and bearing with one another, and unity in the life group and in the church. So if you don't have a life group, uh, please uh, message us so we can connect you to one. So there are two main reasons why our church needs to be united. First is the church is used by God to display God's love, power, and grace. And second is the church is used by God to strengthen, comfort, and send followers of Jesus Christ. So if our church is not united, what kind of picture are we painting for the outside world? If we show them that believers hate each other, then what will they think of God? And if our church is dysfunctional, then we will be sending dysfunctional believers or even hurt and wounded believers into the world. Unity is essential because we are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. We are his representatives to the world. Now, to end my message for today, let me tell you one more story. So, years ago, uh, the Special Olympics was held in Seattle, Washington. One of the races was a 100-yard dash where nine physically and mentally disabled young people gathered at the starting line. The gun went off and the nine began to run as best as they could toward the finish line. Then there was one boy who stumbled on the asphalt. He tumbled over a couple of times and began to cry. The, the other eight runners heard the boy cry. They slowed down and looked back. Then they all turned around and went back, every one of them. One girl with Down syndrome bent down and kissed him and said, this will make it better. Then all nine linked arms and walked together to the finish line together. They say that that day, everyone in the stadium stood and cheered for what seemed like forever. What those children did that day is what God calls us to do. God calls us to love each other so much that when one of us stumbles and falls, we all turn back to help them up and we link arms and walk together towards the gates of heaven. And when we do that, all of heaven stands and cheers for what seems like forever. To close this message, let me tell you this. Church is a family of sinners, an imperfect family loved by a perfect God. Church is not a race or a competition where you have to run alone. Church is not a place to display how great you are. In life, we will stumble many times, and church is a place where you can find people who stumble too. Let's pick each other up from the ground. Let's choose unity. Be someone who changes the culture and the atmosphere of our church. Be the reason why someone will choose to come back to TBC. And don't be the reason why someone leaves TBC. 
Let us be humble, gentle, and patient to one another. Let us not give up on one another. Let us remember what unites us and put aside what divides us. And let us strive for unity in our church. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this message. May you help us, Lord God, be someone who changes the atmosphere in our church, Lord God. May you guide us in our character, in our attitude as we adjust, Lord God, and as we uh, treat others better than ourselves, as we forgive one another and as we endure with one another, Lord God. May you remind us, Lord God, of what unites us as a church and put aside what those things that divide us. Thank you, God, for this message. May you use it, Lord God, to change our life and change our church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.